first off, I want to get started by saying someone the other day um, told me, and I think jokingly asked, um, hey, Pastor Kevin, are you going to preach this weekend with a cape? Um, and I thought to myself, well, I just so happen to have one. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll take it off eventually, but just to satisfy those who are wondering, yes, I will begin with a cape. But thank you so much, Harvest Time, um, for everything, um, uh, for your love, your uh, bringing me right in uh, from a ministry out of Georgia. I came up here um, to be youth pastor, and you guys over the past three years have really become a family, have really become um, lifelong friends. Um, and lifelong family to me. Um, and so first and foremost, thank you so much, Harvest Time, uh, staff, uh, pastors, um, students, and all of you. Uh, thank you so much. I look at my time at Harvest Time, and uh, as I've been going through the past about three days, I've been thinking about my time here, and I look at it, and it, it really is interesting that I start and finish um, with the same theme going along in uh, ministry. When I first came here, uh, we I met the students very first time in the Dome, uh, and we had a games night. We had pizza. We had games. We had fun stuff. How many of the students that are here remember the first time we had the games in the Dome? Uh, do you guys remember playing Ninja when we were playing Ninja? Um, those of you who don't know, it's a fun game the youth play. We, we get our ninja stance on and, um, you know, karate chop people's hands. It's, it's fun. It's exciting. There's a lot of jumping around, falling around, flying all over the floor. Um, and I look at that and I'm like, okay, interesting. And some cool things happen, some not so cool things. And then I look at this past Wednesday as well. Uh, my last time ever speaking with the students as youth pastor in youth group on Wednesday night. And um, I see a very similar thread with both of those instances. Um, both of those instances, I ripped my pants. <laughs> so the very first time I ever encountered the students, I ripped my pants. And the last time I was preaching to them as youth pastor on a Wednesday night, once again, I ripped my pants. So therefore, you may now refer to me as Pastor SpongeBob, who ripped his pants. Thank you. I'm moving into a new area of ministry called Youth Alive. Um, I really feel God has called me into this, into this arena, and it's bittersweet. It's, it's bitter because I think of everything that I've gone through here at Harvest Time, the fun times, uh, the not-so-fun times. Uh, I'm, I think of times, uh, you know, where I've spent with the students talking about Hector. Um, if you don't know who Hector is... Ask one of the students. Um, and I also, I remember also another time, uh, you know, a little worrisome for me. My first trip with the youth ministry, um, taking the kids to summer camp. I thought I, um, how many, how many know Philip Antunis? Is he here, by the way? Philip, are you in here? No, he's not here. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about him regardless. Um, <laughs> Philip, on my very first very first trip with the students, Pastor, you'll remember, I'm driving down the road and, um, and Philip starts choking. And I'm driving down the road and he starts choking and I'm freaking out like I'm thinking he's about to die. Like we're in the middle of the highway, in the middle of nowhere, there's no exits, nothing's going on, no, I can't do anything. And here he is, Philip Antunes, choking right beside me. Like, seriously, I thought he was going to die. I thought it was going to be, I thought my, I'm done here. My job is over. Pastor's going to fire me. <laughs> like, this is the very first trip I ever took the kids on. Um, you know, I thought Philip was going to die. Um, thankfully, he didn't. Everyone ended up fine. I still had my job. And then, you know, I remember, um, <laughs> I remember with Ben, uh, just recently, a few months ago, um, ended up giving him a concussion. Um, 
Yeah, that's a scary moment when you realize you gave your, your pastor's son a concussion. That's it's a little worrisome. I remember the fun times, and it's a little bitter. But I also remember the times uh, of sweetness. I, I, I think of students like Derek Petfield, who has gone through school and has been a, a light in his school, on his football team, his baseball team, and has been used in evangelism to preach and to speak God's word and truth on his school campus. I'm reminded of students, many students, with similar stories. I remember praying for students at, you know, at baseball games, at track meets, at uh, various events, and it's bitter because I know I have to leave, but it's sweet because I know that the schools in this region all across Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island need to be empowered like our students have been, need to be encouraged like our students. And I'm so thankful that God has called me into that. I want to tell you a story about a girl I met while working in Georgia. Her name's Cassie. Cassie grew up without a dad. Um, she grew up, didn't know who her dad was. Her mom was a drunk. She really never knew what love was, ever really never heard those words from any authority, didn't have a father figure. Her mom was pretty much not there. I met her when I was down in Georgia doing a ministry down there before moving up here. And as I, I met her at uh, one of the events that we did in the schools, and uh, she began to tell me her story that uh, she really never felt loved or accepted. So she began to f try to find acceptance through relationships. One after another, uh, one boy after the next left her more hurt and broken than the one before. She began to express the deep inner hurt by cutting herself physically. Hoping that that pain would ease some of the emotional pain she was facing inside. She was desperate, hoping that something would change, but nothing ever did. This young, beautiful 16-year-old girl thought that, started to wonder if life was even worth living. You see, this cuts to my heart because so many students in schools today face these very things. They face not being accepted. They face the desire to fit in, the desire to be somebody, the desire to, to feel loved and accepted. They face all sorts of things at school, drugs and alcohol, substance abuse, bullying. There's so much that these students go through, and it breaks my heart when I hear stories like Cassie's. So many of our students face these things and, and wonder if there is any place that they can turn. Anyone or any place that they can go to. God has called me to Youth Alive. And our purpose is to empower young people to reach their peers. To connect leaders and to reach these schools. We do this through three main ways. Number one is we empower students and resource them to be campus missionaries. To see their school as a mission field. And that they are missionaries to that mission field. We also uh, work closely with the local church and the school administration in developing a good relationship where we can promote and launch Bible clubs. Places where students can freely express their faith in a safe environment on the school campus. We work with the schools and the youth pastors and churches and community to do that. And also we hold... Uh, high school and middle school assemblies called the Seven Project. This is type of an assembly is where I met Cassie. And what we do is we go into schools and talk about various choices that students can make to live the best life possible. And then we invite them to an evening event. You see, Cassie's school was one of these schools. 
Cassie School had campus missionaries, students who were empowered to reach their peers. It had a Bible club where they met every week to speak, uh, to read the word, to go through the word and hold Bible studies. And we brought the Seven Project to this school. And at this school assembly, we brought out a casket out on stage. We opened it up and we said, some of the things that you're facing in life, you need to bury before they bury you. And invited these students to come forward, write things down on slips of paper and drop them into the casket, burying those things. Making a change, making a choice to make a change and make a difference, to live the best life possible. That whole assembly, Cassie, sat up in the stands and didn't come down at all. But Cassie did come to the evening event. Cassie did come to the evening event where she heard the gospel presented, where we tell them that the best life possible is through Jesus Christ, who came to give you life and life to the fullest, joy abundantly. Cassie heard the love of a Savior, and that night she came down and buried her pain in the arms of her Savior, Jesus Christ. Imagine if Cassie's school didn't have campus missionaries. We ended up connecting Cassie to the campus missionaries at her school. They plugged her into the Bible club, and two years later, her senior year, she graduated as the president of that very Bible club. Imagine if there were no campus missionaries to connect Cassie with. Imagine if there were no students empowered to reach their peers. Imagine with me if there was no Bible club to plug her into where she felt loved and accepted. Imagine if the Seven Project, these school assemblies, never went to Cassie's school. My heart breaks for this generation. And God has called me to reach the Cassies of southern New England. All across this region, Cassie's story rings true in students' lives. God has called me to this region for this purpose. And I'm encouraged. And I want to encourage you in ways that you can get involved. First and foremost, I covet your prayers. Um, I have a small booth, a small table out there in the foyer where uh, you can see my face. Um, <laughs> uh, I have prayer cards, and I would love it if every single one of you walked past, walked out there and grabbed a prayer card at the end of the service, and grabbed a card and put it in your Bible, put it on your refrigerator, put it somewhere where you see it, and, um, you know, I would really love it if at every time you see this card, you not just say a prayer for me, but say a prayer for the students of Southern New England. Say a prayer for the students who face difficulties in their schools every day. Say a prayer for them that God would touch their lives and the Holy Spirit would empower them and anoint them to be young men and young women full of the Spirit reaching their schools. There's also a second way that you can join with me. As Pastor Glenn said, um, I am going into missions. And um, the way I raise my funds is I travel around to churches and I speak at churches, organizations, companies. Um, and I invite them to partner with me on a monthly basis, but not just churches and companies, organizations, but um, individuals like yourself, like-minded people who say, I want to invest in what's going, to, what's going on in Southern New England. I want to invest in Youth Alive for Southern New England and uh, invest financially on a monthly basis, uh, becoming a part of the team, becoming a part of my financial support team um, to help launch this brand new ministry up here in Southern New England where we can reach the schools for Christ. And if you would like to be a part of my uh, monthly financial team um, at the table, I, I have sign-ups where you can sign up for more information on that. And as we get started here in the Word, um, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. And as you turn there, I got a story to tell. Everyone here knows I love telling stories. It's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, this is a true story from my college life. It's very embarrassing. Um, here it is. I used to room with a guy whose name is Matt Troiano. Um, I used to room with him and uh, at college, and we were 
a great friend, still are. He texted me this morning, said, called me and said that uh, he was praying for me. And uh, great friends, he lives out on Long Island, and he's very Italian. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, we were roommates, had a great time. I ended up moving out of his room into another room with another good friend of mine. And we had bunk beds, so I got the top bunk. And, um, and uh, I was up there one day, and I was reading a book, and Matt come busting in through the door, opens the door, and just flies in. And uh, <laughs> uh, Matt's the kind of guy where he does goofy stuff all the time for no apparent reason whatsoever. Um, no reason whatsoever. He would just show up with something goofy in his hands or, or do something weird or goofy um, just to kind of like, hey, here I am, haha, and then he'd leave. It's the weirdest, but love him to death. So he, <laughs> he shows up, busts in the door, and shocked, I look up from my book, and I see Matt. And he's, he looks like he's wearing a pair of these glasses with the big thick-rimmed glasses with the, with the eye, eyebrows and the big nose. And I'm, I, I see him, like, bust right on in. And I think he's being goofy. And I'm like, ah, Matt, that's funny. You got one of those, um, those glasses with the fake nose. And he goes, and takes off his brand new glasses that he got from the eye doctor. <laughs> Just so happens, Matt didn't have a pair of these funny glasses. He wasn't trying to be goofy. He was hoping to uh, just get a compliment on his new spectacles. It didn't have a fake nose. He was just blessed with a gorgeous schnoz. I tried my best to make up for it. I'm like, no, Matt, wait. I, uh, but there's no recovery after you just, it's impossible. So, so I was embarrassed and, and you know, it was, it was a, I made the mistake because my perspective was a little messed up. I was up, elevated, couldn't really see right. Lights were a little weird. Um, but my perspective was a little twisted. I thought Matt was goofing. I had the perspective that he was coming in to goof off. Not that he was coming in to show off his new glasses. I had to have a change of perspective to see the situation correctly. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18, we encounter someone who also needed a change of perspective. Talking about Elijah, it says, Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed all of your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So God said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. Verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said yet again, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel, king over Aram, and Jehu, son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about the one who escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will put to death, and the one who escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death, yet I will leave. 7,000 in Israel. These are all of the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Father, I pray you would speak to our hearts today about our perspectives. In Jesus' name, amen. Elijah had to have a perspective change. 
Elijah's hiding up in a mountain, scared for his life. And this is moments after, just moments after, he literally like showed the power of God to the prophets of Baal on Mount, um, wow, that's totally slipping my mind. Um, Carmel, thank you. Woo, preach so many sermons you forget about in a week. My goodness, Mount Carmel. He showed the fire of God at Mount Carmel, ate up the entire sacrifice, and um, and he showed the power of God through all of that. And here he is up in the mountains, and he's hiding for his life, fearing for his life. And God shows up and says, what are you doing, Elijah? He's running for his life because, uh, uh, because, um, because Jezebel said she wanted to kill him. Oh, So just moments after, the power of God uh, eats up an entire sacrifice. All the prophets of Baal turn to God. He, he He runs for his life because someone said they wanted him dead. And he's hiding in a mountain, scared for his life. Elijah needed a perspective change. And just like Elijah needed a perspective change, we might need a perspective change as well. You see, our actions and attitudes are a result of our perspective. Three perspectives that we need to have on life. The first one is this. You need to have a biblical perspective. A biblical perspective. I have, you've heard me preach, maybe those of you that are more recent haven't, but I've preached a sermon a few months ago about biblical illiteracy. I preached a sermon, and it's on the website. You can go on htchurch.com, look at the YouTube page or whatever, and find it. And so I'm not going to go through and hash out all of the stuff about biblical illiteracy today. But let me tell you that the Bible is, is becoming less and less read by people, and it's very drastic. The Bible is rarely picked up anymore. It's come to a point to where the Bible is viewed not just by atheists or liberal scholars, not just by average churchgoers, but even viewed by some pastors. As one has put it, it's an irrelevant, centuries-old combination of outdated material. It's a devastating state we find ourselves in. We, 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 we need to have a biblical perspective on life. If we don't have a biblical perspective on life, the pieces won't fit together. How many of you have your puzzle piece here today? I, I, I want you to imagine you sit down, you have an awesome, you have a, an amazing puzzle like this right here, and, um, and you're going to sit down and you're going to build it with your puzzle pieces. But here's the thing, you have all of your puzzle pieces in, in line, in order, but instead of looking at this box, you're looking at this box. Instead of looking at this one here with the beautiful picture of the lighthouse and the waves, you're looking at a picture of a pug on a beach ball flapping in the water. You've got the wrong box. And when you've got the wrong box, the wrong perspective in life, the pieces won't fit together. When you don't pick up the Bible and read about our guide to life, you are in the, you're looking at the wrong box. What are you using to guide your life? If it's not scripture, you've got the wrong box. We need to be people. We need to be people who pick up the Bible and take it for what it's worth. And listen to what it says. And hear what it's speaking to us. President Theodore Roosevelt said, A thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college degree. A thorough knowledge of the scripture, of understanding it, a thorough knowledge of what the Bible says is worth way more than a college degree. We need to train up our students and even ourselves to study the Word of God. The Bible says we need to study to show ourselves approved. Study so that we may be able to discern right from wrong. You see, when we neglect the Word of God in our lives, we are neglecting the supernatural. 
Let me explain. The Bible, yes, though it is a physical thing that I can have in my hands and open up and read, and I see the letters and the words that are written, though it is a physical thing, its, it's, um, it's inception, its, its beginning is supernatural because it, we know it was written by men who were inspired by God to write down his message to generations past, present, and future. So we know that the word of God is supernatural because it is the very words of God spoken through man's pen to us. When you neglect the word of God, you neglect the supernatural. 2 Timothy verse 3 says that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correction, training in all righteousness. You want to know how to lift your life to the next level? You want to know how to become more righteous? Open up the word of God and begin reading. It says it is all there so that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. How many good work? Every good work. The Bible, the word of God. When we look through the lens and the perspective of Scripture, we need to take all of our situations and our circumstances, everything we hear, everything we encounter, and the first primary lens that we need to see life through is through the Scripture. It's through the Bible. Because our actions and our attitudes are a reflection of our perspective. Not only do we need to have a biblical perspective, but we also must have a kingdom perspective. We also need to have a kingdom perspective that the kingdom is so much greater and bigger than our individual circumstances and situations. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom of heaven and the ways kingdom, what the kingdom of heaven is like. And in verse 59, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm joking, it, it doesn't really say that. There is no verse 59. But if there was a verse 59, it would say, the kingdom of heaven is like a jigsaw puzzle. A man opening the box saw a piece so unique and that he kept it close to his heart. He so loved the one piece so much he didn't want to give it up. He loved how beautiful his individual piece was that he wouldn't even look at any other pieces that were in the box. He would take this puzzle piece with him everywhere he would go. For years he kept it close. He would take it with him shopping. He would take it with him to work. He would take his puzzle piece with him on vacation. He would even put it in a Ziploc bag and take it with him into the shower. He was committed to keeping this piece with him. It wasn't until years later as he was cleaning out his attic that he again saw the box full of puzzle pieces. He began to work tirelessly putting all the pieces back together and and putting the puzzle together. Finally, the puzzle was one piece away from being completed. He pulled his puzzle piece out of his pocket, stared at it for what seemed like hours, and with a tear in his eye, he placed the final puzzle piece. Heartbroken, he stood back to look at the completed puzzle. This piece was with him for all those years, and he had to give it up. As he stood back and he observed the whole puzzle to his amazement, the entire puzzle was even more beautiful and more magnificent than he could have ever imagined. He now saw that the beauty wasn't just in his individual piece, but the beauty was in the entire puzzle. Sometimes we tend to be like the man in this story. We have our peace. We have our puzzle piece in the kingdom. We like our puzzle piece. We've become comfortable with it. It's okay with where it's at. I don't want this puzzle piece to go anywhere. I'm taking it with me. I'm holding on to it with everything I have. And nothing can separate me from my puzzle piece. This is where I am. This is what I'm struggling with. And I'm comfortable with it. I'm okay with my puzzle piece. Your puzzle piece might be beautiful. might have more many different colors and accents. Or it might be dull. 
Whatever stage you find your puzzle piece in, sometimes we need to be able to say, God, I surrender my puzzle piece to you, the great puzzle maker, the great puzzle designer, so you can take this puzzle piece and make it a part of the entire kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, to have a kingdom mindset and see, yes, right now my peace might be dull, but when I place it in the hands of a savior, it becomes something great and beautiful and more magnificent than ever. We need to see our situations through the mindset of the kingdom. Your peace might not be dull, but it might be full of accents and colors and shapes and magnificent and beautiful. And you're saying, I'm comfortable with my beautiful peace. I don't want anything. I'm perfectly fine with this great peace. I don't want anything to happen to this peace. And God is saying, if you just let me use the puzzle piece that I've given you and you in give it to me to invest in the kingdom perspective of the entire puzzle. Greater things are in store. Greater things are possible if you'll just surrender your puzzle piece to the kingdom perspective. We need to surrender to the kingdom perspective when facing difficult situations or even beneficial situations. We need to see them through the lens of the kingdom. And lastly, as we consider perspectives on life, we need to add Christ's perspective. When we look uh, at our situations, we need to see through the lens of Christ's eyes. When we go through difficult times and struggles, what we need to begin to look through is look through the eyes of Christ and say, you know what, I, someone might have done me wrong. Someone did me harm. They hurt me. They hurt the person I love. They are terrible people, and I hate them, can't stand them. And people hurt us. We face situations. God, I'm fired from work, and everyone hates me. We seem to be like Elijah, and we complain, and we say, this is wrong and this is wrong and this person hurt that person and we begin to be these complaining people and what happens is even sometimes in the church we have Christians who hurt people and cause problems and are difficult and when we see these in our flesh we want to say I can't stand them God but when we look through Christ's eyes and use Christ's perspective in our situations We tend then to see, you know what, maybe they hurt me or the person I love because they don't know the true love of a Savior. Maybe they don't know the love of Jesus Christ and hurt people hurt people. And that draws us to compassion. When we have Christ's eyes, when we look through the lens of Christ's perspective, it draws us to have compassion on people instead of anger and rage and frustration. Instead of cursing them, bless them. And pray that God would save them. That God would show them the love of a Savior. Not only that, but when we look through the lens of Christ's perspective, it leads us to evangelism because then we can go to them and say, you know what? I forgive you. And I want to tell you about my Savior, Jesus Christ, who forgave me. Looking through Christ's perspective leads us to compassion and evangelism. If the worship team can come forward, three perspectives to have on life. Number one is a biblical perspective. Number two is a kingdom perspective. And number three, have Christ's perspective. Because our actions and our attitudes are a direct result of our perspective. Are we like Elijah? Do we complain and whine when things don't go our way? Are we like Elijah who who when situations come up, we just begin to pour out everything to God and say, God, why? Why? Why am I, why did I get fired? Why did I get in that accident? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to go about this. I don't know what's going to happen. God, would you change it? God, would you do something great? God, I'm so frustrated at so-and-so, and and they're angry and making me mad, and, and God, this happened, and I'm so hurt, and I'm crushed, and I'm angry, and I'm the only one left that's going through this. No one else knows what I'm going through. No one else can understand my situations. God, would you change everything? And my question is, maybe 
we need to stop asking God to change our situations and ask God to change our perspective. To change our perspective into something new, full of mercy and grace. Would you stand with me today? You see, Elijah, after God changed his perspective, after God changed his perspective, Elijah went on to anoint two kings, a prophet, and get taken up to heaven in a whirlwind after his perspective was changed. Today, will you listen for the still small voice of God saying, what are you doing here? Let's change your perspective. Will you bow your heads all across this room? Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and mercies. I ask God that we would have a right perspective in our lives. God, that we would consider the biblical perspective. That we would take scripture as it is. And we would understand that we need to be seeking you through the Bible. And looking at what your word says about situations and circumstances. God, I pray that we would be men powerful in the spirit. Full of uh, full of the scripture and the word. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us. Help us, God, to see the big picture of the kingdom perspective. God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would have be people who look not at just our puzzle piece, but how can our puzzle piece fit into your great grand plan. Father, and I pray in Jesus' name that you would give us the eyes of Christ. That we who have eyes, would you open them up to see with the eyes of Christ, of compassion, of love. And God, would you motivate us to look at our situations differently. Would you help us, God, to change our perspective. In Jesus' name, amen.